recorded in a moment. As if on cue. Um, yeah, so we'll be recording so that we can share with those folks who couldn't attend. Et puis euh, aussi, c'est important de noter que les séances en petits groupes ne seront pas euh, enregistrées. Donc, euh, ces séances-là ne seront pas enregistrées. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, my co-host Julie and I are going to switch between English and French. Uh, to follow along in the language of your choice, we're providing the script, which is in English and in French, um, in the chat. Uh, so Rimsha, who's behind the scenes here at the Child and Nature Alliance uh, Black Square, um, she'll be posting that in the chat momentarily. And our co colleague Stéphanie will also be providing a summary chat or a summary translation in the chat. Stéphanie, can you wave for us? Okay, awesome. There's the link. Merci, Stéphanie. Okay. So we'll get started in earnest here with uh, the land acknowledgement. So CNAC is headquartered on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe in what is now known as Ottawa, Ontario. Our organization is currently led by white settlers and we've imposed a settler colonial way of being with the land because our programs were not co-created with indigenous people. We are committed to repairing our relationships with Indigenous communities by dismantling harmful practices and changing the way we operate and co-creating programs. And we are really in a deep and sort of ongoing, not sort of, an ongoing learning process about uh, what that means. Uh, yeah, the many sort of layers of learning what that means. Um, I'm personally grateful to this land where I am now uh, for being the land that has sort of invited me in to the process of learning what being in a reciprocal relationship with land can mean. And I'm grateful for those teachings and those lessons, um, grateful for the way this land supports me as I uh, raise my three young children. Um, I'm grateful just for that, pa the patience I feel from the land around my uh, not knowing, not knowing even how to go about this learning. Um, I am currently the Director of Learning at the Child and Nature Alliance of Canada. Uh, it's a new role for me when I'm still sort of figuring out what that uh, all means, but I've been with CNAC um, for about seven years now, actually started with the Ottawa Forest and Nature School before that was even part of CNAC. Um, and I've been um, with Forest School Canada and CNAC ever since that all kind of came together back in 2014, 2015. So over to you, Julie. Oui, merci, Petra. Alors, um, pour notre reconnaissance de territoire, on voudrait mentionner que la Child and Nature Alliance of Canada a son siège social sur les territoires non cédés des Algonquins Anishinaabe, euh, dans ce qu'on appelle aujourd'hui Ottawa. Et puis, nous voulons reconnaître que notre organisation est ac actuellement dirigée par des colonisateurs blancs et que nous avons imposé une manière coloniale d'être avec la Terre parce que nos programmes n'ont pas été co-créés avec les peuples autochtones. Nous nous engageons à réparer notre relation avec les communautés autochtones en démantelant les pratiques nuisibles et en changeant notre mode de fonctionnement et en co-créant des programmes avec les peuples autochtones. Euh, C'est un processus dans lequel on est engagé euh, depuis un certain temps qui nous tient à cœur et puis euh, pour lequel on, on prend euh, du temps pour euh, vraiment réfléchir en profondeur. Euh, pour ma part, je suis aussi reconnaissante pour la terre qui... Euh, qui m'entoure et puis avec laquelle j'ai la chance d'apprendre avec les enfants euh, et puis toutes les leçons que la Terre a à m'apporter. Euh, la patience, le fait de toutes les leçons, le fait de, de laisser aller puis de, de pouvoir prendre notre temps. Donc, euh, je remercie la Terre pour ça. Euh, pour ma part, je suis avec l'organisation de SENAC euh, depuis euh, 2016. Et puis, euh, ou 2017, 2016, 2017, et puis euh, j'ai la chance d'être facilitatrice depuis ce temps. 
euh, de rencontrer euh, plein d'éducateurs à travers le Canada, d'apprendre avec eux euh, à travers les cours de praticiens. Et puis, j'ai aussi la chance de travailler dans un programme d'école de la nature euh, à l'école Rivière-Rideau euh, dans mon autre emploi. Donc, euh, je suis bien contente d'être avec vous ici ce soir. Alors, on peut poursuivre, Petra. Je te donne la parole. Sure. So today's uh, today's event is part of a three-year community consultation project that we're undertaking with support from the Lawson Foundation. I'm sure those of you who have joined several fireside chats are like, yeah, we got it. We know. <laughs> But I'll share anyways, for in case we have some new folks, we do have some new names with us. So uh, our goal with this project is to meet with forest and nature school practitioners across uh, what is currently called Canada so that we can articulate as a community what a quality forest nature school in Canada looks like, sounds like, and feels like improve our professional learning courses and potentially set the stage for representing the forest and nature school sector in discussions around policy and systems change. Alors, euh, ce qu'on espère pour la conversation d'aujourd'hui, c'est qu'on aimerait avoir des discussions animées sur ce que ça veut dire euh, des pratiques de qualité dans un, une école de la nature. Donc, quels sont les indicateurs de, de qualité? Euh, aussi, c'est important de savoir que nous, chez Sénac, euh, nous ne sommes pas là pour juger la pratique de qui que ce soit ou pour critiquer. Euh, on veut surtout vous entendre, savoir qu'est-ce que ça veut dire pour vous, les indicateurs de qualité. Et puis, euh, J'espère que, euh, comme on peut tous voir, on sait qu'on est tous ici des gens passionnés par l'école de la nature. On sait qu'il va peut-être avoir des différences d'opinion. Et puis, on pense que ces différences sont euh, essentielles et puis qu'elles nous rendent plus riches. Donc, euh, on demande à tous de garder l'esprit ouvert et puis euh, d'accepter les différences d'opinion, évidemment. Puis, euh, ensemble, c'est comme ça qu'on va arriver à un apprentissage encore plus riche puis une compréhension encore plus riche de ce que ça veut dire... Euh, des indicateurs de qualité pour l'école de la nature. Yeah, merci Julie. I think Stephanie will put all of that uh, in English in the transcription. We got a little bit mixed up in our spot. So one thing, I'll, Stephanie, if you scroll down a bit, you'll see. Um, but one thing I did want to mention before we dive into anything is that First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities have been learning from this land and teaching their children on the land since time immemorial. And this project is not meant to advise or in any way regulate Indigenous communities. We are specifically focused on addressing settler organizations who are operating forest and nature schools on Indigenous land. Um, and again, we're still deep in the learning about what that means and, and whether this project is the right way to go about that. So yeah, all of it is an open question um, that we're learning about. So I, I think we've set the purpose of the fireside chat um, through Julie. Um, and she mentioned that uh, we're gonna have a, a lively and respectful conversation. Um, and if you have any questions or thoughts after this, you're welcome to share them in whatever way is best for you. So that might be video, audio, or written, and you can send them to community at childnature.ca. Rimsha, maybe you can just put that in the chat. Um, you can also complete the survey for this session, uh, which will also be linked in the chat, and it is available on our website. Julie, do you want to say that bit in French, maybe? Uh, sure. Alors, euh, c'est important de, de savoir que, ben, je pense qu'on a bien expliqué qu'est-ce que c'était les causeries au coin du feu. Et puis, on est toujours ouvert à entendre vos suggestions, à avoir vos commentaires. Donc, si jamais, suite à cette conversation, vous avez des commentaires ou des idées à nous faire parvenir, c'est toujours possible de nous écrire à euh, euh, mis cette adresse dans, euh, dans le clavardage. Donc, euh, on vous encourage à utiliser cette adresse courriel si jamais vous voulez communiquer avec nous par la suite. On est ouvert à vos idées, vos suggestions, euh, vos commentaires. 
Great. Okay. So without any further ado, we'd love you to meet our amazing panelists for today's chat. Sonia, would you please introduce yourself? Sure, I will. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Sonia. My pronouns are she, her. I'm of white settler heritage. I live and work and play and raise my family uh, in the Ottawa area. So on uh, traditional and unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe land. I feel a strong connection to this land and the land where I grew up uh, just a few hours east of here and the land where I spent some hours or some years going to school, a lot of hours north of here along Lake Superior. Um, I've been fortunate to have my life and work revolve mostly around being outside. My adult work life has been thus far, there's kind of three chapters. Uh, my first was working with folks from urban centers, um, leading wilderness trips on the land for them, with them, and nurturing connection and healing on the land in a very playful way, though we didn't often maybe use the word play. Oh, sometimes we did, but um, for sure we were playing. I did that for about 10 years, and then I spent about 10 years playing on the land much closer to home with my own children. I have three boys, they're teens now. And then the last, yeah, I'm like usually 2015, 16, 17, I think it was around 2015, I stepped into being able to work at Ottawa Forest and Nature School and with CNAC and kind of brought those two worlds together of working with adults, youth and families and children. Um, in a way that specifically has been about trusting that while people are playing, they are doing what they need to and learning. Uh, often the word learning has been essential because I've worked with a lot of school groups and I facilitated a lot of groups for adults who are educators. I mean, I, I think all adults are educators, but people whose work is defined as being an educator. Um, and yeah, so my work has been able to revolve around nurturing play with children, families, adults, communities, making it more accessible, hopefully. Um, and yeah, there's been, there's a personal journey that weaves through there as well. And maybe I won't step too far into that right now. Um, I will say that I feel gratitude to be a part of this here gratitude to have had a chance to work with and play with and get to know the folks that I have and the land and the places where I have and to have um, so many times have had to have had lessons um, just swirled and drifted to me by my time on the land with folks. Um, I feel gratitude and I'm happy to have a chance to maybe share a bit of that here with you folks. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Sonia. Merci beaucoup. Um, Césario, je te demanderais maintenant uh, de te présenter toi aussi uh, dans la langue de ton choix. Donc, uh, up to you, Césario. Merci, Julie. Uh, moi, c'est Césario aussi. Uh, I'm Césario aussi. Um, mes pronoms sont uh, il, lui. My pronoun pronouns are he and him. Um, je vais parler en anglais parce que ça fait longtemps depuis que j'ai parlé français dans un uh, environ professionnel. <laughs> uh, but I, I grew up between um, Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, uh, which is Treaty 6 territory and uh, the traditional homeland of the Métis and the Cree, uh, and uh, Toronto, um, which is the territory of many nations, including um, the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, uh, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Um, and currently, I live in Montreal, or Jajage, um, which is unceded territory of the Ganyagahaga, and uh, also a traditional meeting place for many nations. Um, I am a I guess, first and a half uh, generation Canadian. Um, my dad is an immigrant from Northern Ireland and my mom's family immigrated here from Calabria uh, in the 50s. Um, uh, yeah, I guess uh, 
I wear many hats. Um, my, my primary hats are that I'm uh, an illustrator, a comics maker, and an educator. Um, right now, I work with Le Lyon et la Surie, which is uh, an organization that promotes free play uh, outdoors, but uh, with a particular emphasis uh, on uh, public spaces in, in urban settings. So uh, it's sort of like, it is a forest school, but it's a, an urban forest school. Um, and um, right now I am on a sabbatical working on my first graphic novel, um, which I'll have more to say about when I'm further along, but uh, yeah, that's, that's it for now. That's me. Thanks, Cesario. Merci. Okay, so last but not least, we'll go to you, Chloe. Please introduce yourself. Chloe Dragon Smith Brenda Dragon Leonard Smith I'm Chloe Dragon Smith. Uh, I'm from Denende, which is our Dene word for the Northwest Territories. My mother is Brenda Dragon and my father is Len Smith. Very important to us in the North to introduce ourselves by our families. So I of an ode to uh, where we come from and that we are only just a, a small piece on a, my pronouns are John, Sonia and Cesario saying that I think that's the first time I've actually seen that in a meeting so happy to I'm calling in right now from my home which is in the middle of Wood Buffalo National Park we live in an off-grid cabin is it um for me Petra I'll just check in at this point yeah, I just put a thing in the chat to um, see if we turn our videos off, if we can hear better. I don't know if um, I'm having trouble hearing Chloe. Yeah, it's just like a little bit like bumpy. Um, so it seems like people are having better luck when they turn their video. Hello? Shoot. Can you hear me, Chloe? We'll just keep our videos off for now. And hopefully that will help with the sound. Just can you hear me? Up. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, good to go. There's a lag though. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Yes, I can hear you. Is that coming through okay? Shoot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I think I was great in my home, which is um, a little cabin in the by the It comes and goes, but hopefully we'll be okay. If you start to have trouble hearing me or text me, then I'll be Okay, so um, uh, it's there that I started um, 
kids with another teacher school a bit of a strange way I rather uh, conservation work I loved the land and I wanted to learn more that's um, what made sense to me so I did a scientist um, oh I just got a text from Petra and just see if that helps you guys can carry on okay sorry Chloe I know I've been on other calls with Chloe though where she figures it out and comes in and out. So I know we'll be able to hear Chloe again and hopefully when her connection's a bit easier, we can return to her intro. Um, but in the meantime, why don't we, um, Chloe, are you there or should I move into questions? Um, I'm here, but if we're having trouble, why don't we just move into questions? You're very clear right now. Why don't we run oh, with great. it? Okay, um, so I'm not sure what you were able to hear of that intro at the start, but basically my context and relation to forest and nature school comes actually through conservation and particularly indigenous led conservation. Um, I got into conservation work, basically just following the flow of my love for the land and just meeting people and uh, taking opportunities and I got into work around conservation and very quickly realized that from my perspective and Indigenous worldview, conservation makes no sense unless we are connecting young people with the land to grow relationship and care for the land. And so it was from there that I co-founded Bush Kids, which is our um, forest and nature school initiative in Yellowknife. Uh, with my co-founder, Wendy Leahy. Uh, we work really hard at Bush Kids to create what we call ethical space, which is a theoretical space between worldviews where we work with the worldviews of the Western curriculum that's mainstream in our schools and create a healthy, balanced space with Indigenous perspectives and worldviews. And so it's been, it's been quite a journey for me. Um, I myself am mixed blood. My, my heritage is Dene saint French, uh, German and Métis. And so um, the concept of ethical space and working between worldviews is a, is a really big passion of mine and, some, and a space that I spend a lot of time in no matter where I am. So, I'm really happy to be here. I hope my internet cooperates. Um, thank you, everyone. Tahuna. Tahuna, Chloe, thank you so much. That was great. That was clear. So yes, I hope the internet will uh, cooperate with us as well. Okay, so let's move into some discussion questions. So um, to get started, we're going to talk about story and forest and nature school in general. We're going to offer the same question to each panelist and invite you, the audience members, to participate in the poll and the chat as well. Um, and if you looked at the info sheet on our website in advance of this fireside chat, you may notice that the questions are slightly different. Um, we're actually attempting to open the questions up a little bit to allow for greater expression uh, from the panelists instead of kind of limiting them or boxing them into responding to our questions and our ways of thinking. So panelists, in that spirit, if any of the questions that we offer you today don't actually get at what you're hoping to express, um, please feel free to take us in a different direction. Okay. So Cesario, let's start with you. What is your relationship with story and how does that show up in your forest and nature school practice? Or is there somewhere else you'd like to begin? Uh, that's a great place to begin for me, I think. Um, uh, story has always been a very central and important part of my life and my way of relating to the world, which I think, I think it is for, for most people if not all, um, but um, when I was a young kid, 
my mom uh, worked, had a part-time job, but like uh, reshelving books at the public library. And I used to go with her to her shifts a lot of the time. Uh, and there was, um, there were times where she was assigned um, to work in the children's department where there was this sort of like uh, center called mm -hmm. Winnie the Pooh Corner where like uh, children's librarians would tell stories for, for a, a child audience. Um, and uh, it was going there to my mom's shifts and like hoping that there would be something, mm -hmm. some storytelling uh, at Winnie the Pooh Corner that like uh, gave me my first thirst for storytelling. Uh, there was a really wonderful children's librarian there uh, who I remember by name, his name was Gary Tisdale. And he made all of these like very beautiful, elaborate puppets. Um, and he told a lot of kind of classic fables, uh, cross-cultural, but also would reenact um, some like popular English language children's books, like the frog and toad stories. Um, and uh, I was like very, very riveted by this uh, as a child. Um, Yes, Pooh Corner is still there right now, I think, uh, at Francis Morrison Library in Saskatoon. Um, uh, my mom is also, uh, she was a, a school teacher for 35 years and um, was a, a librarian, a school teacher librarian, and she was in a storytellers guild. So from my relationship with my mom, I got like a real love. of stories um, uh, making and like a uh, big part of my childhood was just like making up, asking for stories to be made up for me. Um, uh, another kind of aspect of my relationship to story is through um, my cultural identity uh, and uh, religious identity as a Jew. Um, the way that uh, the way that story functions in Judaism is also very central. Uh, there's a cycle of reading the same stories over and over again on a yearly cycle. And the celebration of adulthood is about showing that you can read a story and interpret it and offer your own take on it. Um, that's what happens at a bar about mitzvah. Um, yeah, and as a... Um, so the way that it shows up in, in my forest school practice, I would say is I really encourage children to develop sort of like their own personal lore um, or their own uh, sort of narrative stories about their experiences, about their lives. I think that's the first way Storytelling is kind of like the first way that children process any information or, um, you know, like when we see kids reenacting things that have happened in the day or things that they've seen um, a parent or caregiver do, um, they're telling a story, right? Like with their bodies, but they're, they're storytelling. So uh, encouraging, encouraging that is a very large component. I also think that, uh, developing stories together. Like for example, um, uh, at the summer camp that we do at Le Lyon et la Surie, all the kids uh, had sort of like this story that was sort of like introduced lightly by uh, one of the facilitators about a troll who like lived in the, in the field where we, where we play and learn. Uh, and the kids like really took off with this and like made this beloved ca troll character have like many characteristics and would like leave things for the troll, make sure that uh, there was like always like jam for the troll, um, all these things. And I think it's like great to foster this kind of thing, uh, even if it like doesn't seem very serious or like you can't really see what like the but like uh, just having sort of like stint narrative that anybody can feed into and that everybody can be a collective part of, I think is really powerful. And it's, um, it's like a real way that a group bonds with each other as well. Um, that's, I think telling stories and sharing storytelling 
can be like a very profound um, mechanism for maintaining a relationship or uh, building a relationship. Um, I think also as like a, a as a teaching a teaching tool, stories are very useful in both maybe not explaining but offering some ideas and thoughts on why things are the way they are right now as well as introducing the possibilities of how things could be um and that's sort of like one of the most exciting modes that storytelling can have in a forest school setting i think is showing us um possibilities that we haven't thought of um and uh and the ways that things have been and can been, it can be, yeah. Merci beaucoup, Cesario. C'est tellement intéressant de t'entendre parler des histoires puis de voir comment tu vois le rôle de l'histoire à l'école de la nature. Um, ce que tu mentionnes sur les relations, sur la façon de... de processer les émotions, ce qui se passe autour de nous, de comprendre comment la vie euh, se déroule autour de nous, c'est vraiment intéressant puis c'est vraiment euh, important. Donc, merci d'avoir partagé ça avec nous, puis merci aussi de, de partager euh, de toi aussi euh, et de ta culture et d'où tu viens euh, en parlant des histoires. Donc, merci euh, pour ton partage. Euh, Sonia, on va passer à toi pour la prochaine question. Alors, je vais te poser la même question. Je vais y revenir en anglais. Donc, euh, quelle est ta relation avec les histoires et comment est-ce que ça se manifeste euh, dans ta pratique des codes de la nature? Donc, euh, Sonia, I'm going to ask you the same question. So, how, what is your relationship to story, stories, and how does that come up in your forest school practice? Or if there's something else that you would like to touch upon, feel free to to talk about that too. Merci Julie. And thanks C, that was really fun to listen to. I'd love to sit and chat. I mean, we're sitting and chatting now and more. Um, so I'll say that the word history has bugged me for a long time because the words his and story put together and where like the history that I learned in school came from Um, always felt wrong and as I got older I realized the reason why it felt wrong was because only certain voices were represented and for certain reasons and so many people were left out and interesting how in French it's the same word les histoires and l'histoire but um, I won't get into too much of like where words come from I don't know that much but I've really tried in my life with just my life and with my work and play with folks to use the word story instead of history. And it's opened up this whole way of seeing space and people and truth and ways of being. For me, that feels so much more open and not one linear way, but like branching extensions of truth. And, um, which is the way I think so many children live their lives anyway. Like so many things can exist at the same time, which might be considered um, not actually possible in reality. But for, if we're talking about story, so many things can be true. And I've, so that has made a huge shift for me in the way I view the way I am with people and how I present myself and how I present words and lessons and places where folks can potentially learn or learning can emerge. And so I love to ask people, well, what do you think? When they say, what is the story? What is the history? I love to say, well, what do you think? And then together we can weave a story and we often pick up pieces from what's around us and we pick up pieces from what's inside us and we pick up pieces from the folks around us conversations that we've heard as C mentioned like the truth that is people's lives away from where we are in the moment and a story gets woven there which is true regardless of how much fact is in it and that being able to hold space for that to happen with the children that I work with and with the educators that I work with mentoring 
doing this sort of thing. And with uh, the adults who I've worked with who are hoping to do this sort of work somehow, work and play, bringing more play into their work, I'm grateful to have a chance to, to do that and to realize that, uh, like I, I'm totally down with science, uh, I'm, I'm there. It's important and real and so many other things are. And I love to be able to hold space with children where we say, well, what do you think? And there can be so many different perceptions of and various truths there and there's room for them all. I feel like there's so many um, ways of holding space with children that if we can continue to nurture as they get older can help make adult life kinder too for those children when they're adults and for the people around them. Um, I'm just looking over at the question again. I'm grateful to not feel this need to like pull myself back to summarize to the question. Thank you, Julie and Petra and other folks who are involved in like opening up the question way of being. Um, and I mean, we'll talk later, I think of like a role that like telling stories can have in like a day-to-day -day way with children and groups. So maybe I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. As I was listening to you, actually, it made me, I felt like I was hearing in you, in what you were saying, story as a way of uh, maybe holding that or building that ethical space that Chloe um, spoke about in her introduction. So I wonder if that might come out more in our chat as well. And Chloe, I wonder how your internet is in this moment for us to offer you the same question in terms of what is your relationship with story and how does that show up um, for you in your work, either at Bush Kids or elsewhere, um, or is there somewhere else that you'd like to begin? So let's cross our fingers for the internet. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Awesome. I'm, uh, I'm on both phone and internet now, so I hope this works a little bit better. Um, so I, I spent some time thinking about how to best articulate story and what story means to me. And I just have to keep digging back through these foundations, I guess, of, of my worldview and connection with the land to get there. And so to start off, I think, um, I'd like to explain the concept of natural law as a really important foundation for story. And so natural law, um, for me, how I understand it is the way that the land works when it's under its own rules, it's self-determined and it's operating with its own agency. So these are the laws that every being, including humans lived by before colonization and Canadian law. Natural law, um, it can manifest in ways as complicated as, for instance, the life and behavior of a great and complex predator like a wolf or a bear, or sometimes uh, it manifests also in something as simple as the pattern of growth from a fern. But these, although they might seem very different, are very much tied together as everything is tied together under natural law. And so that's the understanding that no nothing has occurred in a vacuum and we're all in relationship. So the land is working in intricate and overlapping relationships, meeting at different spaces and stages um, in time and space. And so the boundaries within these relationships, the agreements of roles and responsibilities could be understood as treaties within this realm of natural law. So how we're interacting with each other. And to survive for most of human history, people had to participate every day in those agreements. We had to listen to others and observe and participate in our own stories and the stories of others. Uh, that was essential to our survival. So natural law is always working through relationship meaning that we are all built for connection, participation with each other, and therefore emergent learning and process-driven learning. In that way, 
to me, the power of stories for us is not accidental. It's 100% by design. We're all subject to natural laws and we have uncountable years of history where listening to and telling stories was our primary way of communicating and surviving. So a fundamental through which all beings relate to the world around them. And I think that's why it makes so much sense to us and to children. Many indigenous cultures, we still remember this, which is why we continue to be oral peoples with stories shared and told through generations. Um, it's, it's not an extra, it's a, it's a real fundamental. It's a responsibility. And there's a lot that goes along with that. For instance, um, once you've been told a story, it's now your responsibility to carry it on by sharing it. So there's built-in mechanisms for story to continue and to move through societies. And I think overall, um, stories are a tool and a way of sharing laws and treaties that allow us to thrive as part of life on earth. Um, it's a pretty big picture of story, but I think it's, it's really important for me when I consider story to think about just how fundamental it is to who we are as humans and then what that means for me, what it means for learning, what it means for teaching um, follows fairly shortly after that. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Chloe. There's so much there that we can dig into and I'm hoping that your internet will will remain as good as it is right now um, so that we can circle back to some of those themes that you brought up, um, specifically around the role of play and learning. So maybe, or sorry, story and learning. So maybe we'll circle back to you, but I'll hand over to Julie for now um, before we do that. Yeah, thanks, Petra, and uh, thanks everyone for everything that you've offered. This discussion is really rich. Alors, merci à tous. Um, on va prendre le temps d'être un peu plus précis pour l'instant. On va discuter um, d'un des principes spécifiques de l'école de la nature, uh, tel qu'on l'a défini chez SINAC. Et puis, c'est que l'école de la nature est dirigée par des éducateurs qui partagent le pouvoir avec les apprenants par le biais de méthodes d'enseignement et d'apprentissage basées sur l'apprentissage par le jeu, le curriculum émergent et l'apprentissage par enquête. Donc, euh, les questions qu'on va vous offrir, encore une fois, euh, n'hésitez pas à les critiquer ou vous en éloigner. Euh, donc, voilà. So, um, so, we'll be a bit more precise and we'll discuss around one of the specific principles of Forest and Nature School. And um, we know that with CNAC, um, what we've done is describe this principle as... Um, sharing power with learners through play-based play -based emergent and inquiry-driven learning. And so um, these questions will touch upon this. Um, so for our panelists, please feel free again to take us in any which direction that you feel or to critique these questions themselves. So this time we'll start with Sonia. On va commencer avec Sonia. Um, ce que je vais te poser comme question, c'est quel rôle jouent les histoires uh, lorsque tu interagis avec les familles et les enfants sur la Terre? So what role does story play when you interact with families and children on the land? Thanks, Julie. Um, I, I took a few notes. I wrote some notes down. So story is one of the first ways that we get to know people. I'm, a, I'm picturing working with a group of families or a group of children on a first day. I mean, or many days, but the first day especially. It's one of the first ways that we interact and get to know each other. Um, we are usually gathered in a circle Uh, possibly around a fire, all seated. So I feel like there's a way that power is shared or um, the, the, the field the, is, is even. And I might, I might not be seated depending on how animated I am in, a, in the telling of a story to um, hold attention or get attention, but we may all be seated. Um, most folks will be. 
Um, it's a way of introducing folks to the space and the place and the creatures in the place without uh, being didactic and just talking at folks. We can have a story that's taking place in a place very much like this. And perhaps characters are creatures from, characters in the story are creatures that could live in the forest around us and that can help folks feel connected. Um, the story can emerge based on questions folks have been asking or interests they've shown or curiosity. So it can help tie in where they're at and what they're feeling to, to where we are. So I feel like that's a connection. Um, it's an opportunity to share intentional lessons, which are, uh, Chickadee was so cold when she fell into that puddle. Do we wanna feel like Chickadee? So how can we not feel like Chickadee? Um, that sort of thing can happen. I find it's so much, children are so much more receptive to um, being able to and willing to make smarter, safer choices when they've had as their models, characters in stories, as opposed to an adult in front of them telling what, them what to do and not do. Uh, I find stories especially offer invitations to believe in magic and seek out magic and uh, put on a different lens than perhaps they're used to for adults and children. This question specifically mentions families. I can remember a number of parents, grandparents, educators who get very wrapped up in stories too not just zoned out and like busy thinking about the other things they have to do, but like pulled into story and pulled into the magic too, which um, I think enhances and enriches their relationship with the people around them and the land as they go off to play afterwards, which leads to uh, a story in the practice that I am accustomed to, like the rhythm of the practice when I'm involved in uh, forest and nature school inspired work is the day usually starts with, um, very early on we have a story together which then leads us into the play so provides some not so hidden lessons or some inspiration or invitations uh, lenses to help uh, potentially children look through as they head off and might inform um, their play for the day. So maybe I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Sonia. I'm, I have memories. I'm, as you're talking, I'm picturing you in your element uh, in the circle with, with children and families. Um, okay, so let's hand it back to you, Cesario, from here, and maybe you can share about your thoughts about how stories and play are intertwined. What, what role does story have in play? Thank you for this. Great question. Uh, I do. I do think that they are inextricable. Um, I think that stories are stories can be a kind of play, uh, and play is almost always a kind of story. Um, like I was talking about before, even uh, in sort of like these pre-verbal ways of reenacting things, kids are telling stories. Um, I think uh, stories deepen our deepen the richness of play, uh, and I think they can also um, they don't always necessarily, but I think they can inform the culture of play, uh, and it can sort of be uh, the way that we share stories um, can be a way of setting sort of like the relational tone um, of this gathering of people, of young people. Um, I think uh, the way that kids uh, use stories uh, is often uh, in play, is often as like fuel for their play um, or to have sort of like a loose script or a set of understandings in their play can be used as a, a shorthand for kids who like who know a story, who have a common knowledge of a story. Um, and I think it's, it's also uh, one way that I see kids use it a, a lot 
either in play or like as a sort of um, interlude in play is relational, is um, sort of uh, a way of relating to each other, a way of saying like something similar happened to me, whether it's offered in the spirit of empathy or just sort of to talk and to share. Um, I think that's sort of like, a, that's a way I see it show up and play a lot. Um, I think uh, like stories aren't, are st stories are a, like a neutral thing, right? Like they can be used in many ways. They're like, uh, uh, you know, there are stories that we hear that are, that maybe are not true or are promote cruelty or whatever. Um, so I think there's, uh, there's a lot of responsibility around, around storytelling and around like creating a culture of storytelling in play um, where it's a story is told uh, responsibly um, and with either, you know, some combination of, of permission, understanding and competence. Um, and the way that, you know, we can kind of like scale that down for kids, um, I think is just to like ask them questions like, where is this story from? Is this a, if it's not a story that happened to you, where did you hear it? And just like asking these questions of like, where, where do stories come from? Um, and that can be, I think, uh, a super powerful way of connecting them to bigger ideas about why certain stories are told, why, um, you know, like one thing that comes up a lot is like, uh, if, you know, uh, Sonia, you're talking about history and how a lot of what we've been taught as history uh, is in fact garbage. Um, and sometimes like the first time that you offer that like something might not be true and it's a commonly understood uh, idea in our culture, there'll be like a lot of shock that like a story that's not true could gain such traction and popularity. And I remember feeling that as a kid too. And sometimes feeling that as an adult also just being like, how did this, how did we get this wrong for so long? Uh, and I'm sure I'll continue to feel it. Um, but I think that's like a really powerful uh, exploration for kids uh, to consider. Um, and also, uh, you know, that's a way for them to learn the kind of power that stories can have uh, so that uh, they can apply some care and some intention as to how, how they play with stories. Um, and like, you know, like there are lots of different kinds of stories. Some stories are like cool to play with whenever you want. And some stories are like uh, kind of special and, and need some respect or reverence. Um, yeah, I feel like I've gone on for quite a bit. So I'll hand things back over. Merci beaucoup, C. Um... Encore une fois, tu nous rappelles des leçons importantes de considérer les, la puissance des histoires, le pouvoir qui vient avec le, le, le fait de raconter des histoires, mais aussi la responsabilité qui vient avec les histoires qui nous sont partagées puis celles qu'on partage. Donc, merci de, de nous rappeler ça. Euh, alors, on va poursuivre. Euh, on va poursuivre avec les questions. So, we'll continue with the questions. Uh, for Chloe. Alors, je vais demander à Chloé, um, quel rôle joue l'histoire dans l'apprentissage des enfants ou les histoires uh, dans l'apprentissage des enfants? Parce que en français aussi, Sonia, tu l'as mentionné, mais ce n'est pas un concept qui est facile à traduire dans un mot, le fait de raconter des histoires. Um, ce qu'on appelle storytelling en anglais, ce n'est pas facile à traduire. Donc, quel rôle jouent les histoires dans l'apprentissage des enfants? So, Chloé, what role does a story play in children's learning? Merci, Julie. Um, so, I, you know, I was thinking about um, just preparing for this talk 
again, about stories and their foundation and natural law. Um, and for this question, I think it's important to go back to one thing I brought up about natural law at the start. And that is that it's very deeply about self-determination. And that means self-determination for animals, plants, rivers, um, anything on the land, um, but also for us as people. And it's so important that we know ourselves well and how we fit into each relationship and each story on the land. And I think in thinking about that, it's easy enough to think about a relationship with a friend or a spouse. And I think it's, you know, a, a close relationship like that, if you go into it without knowing yourself, you're bound to have a lot of problems. And I think that's fairly well known. The same thing can be translated to make sense about our relationships on the land. And so by using stories as a teaching tool, we allow for each individual to learn by relating to the stories of another. And that gives us the space to self-determine the learning through our own lens, if that makes sense. So I think everybody will understand if you can hear the same story 20 different times through your life and depending on what's happening at that time for you and where you are on your journey, different learnings are gonna come up. And I think in the same way, 20 different children may interpret a story 20 different ways. And that is the beauty of the self-determination of the learning. And so through our stories, we can navigate the boundaries of our own self-determination, who we are and how we fit within the stories of others, which is that deep relationality on the land um, that really makes us who we are. And I think that kids are really hungry for stories because as they are this essential tool of communication and natural law and how we've evolved, they're so deeply a part of us and we just don't get them nearly enough. And so because they aren't integrated into life the same way that they have been in the past and were meant to be, we kind of crave them. And I think that kids are really attuned to this as they don't dull their needs so much as we do as adults. And that is why I think um, kids are kids are always asking for stories and so attentive. Um, it's almost like a hunger for for what they need. And you know, being able to tell, I think Cesario, you were saying some really important things about the responsibility that comes with stories and the stories that we tell using stories from the land that we're on and being able to share stories that really do help us to understand ourselves uh, within the time and the space and the place that we're in is a really, uh, really, really important teaching tool. And so thinking, you know, who, who has those stories, who can share those stories appropriately? How can those stories be well received in the places we are? Uh, are really important questions. Thank you. Chloe, it's me who's supposed to ask um, the follow-up questions, <laughs> and I don't. I don't feel like I can do that right now. I don't think that. I think I need to take some time and space myself to to know what to ask um because our you know we were going to ask if you wanted to say anything more about the relationship between place and land and story um but i feel like i mean you you, you did start to get into that is there any is there any last thoughts that you want us to know um or any questions that you want us to be asking ourselves in this audience um, about story and, and story's relationship to land and to children? Um, 
Thanks, Petra. Yeah, I mean, I think it would just be like our re the relationship of story to land and place is it's complex in a way, and in some ways, it's also so simple. Everything comes, everything stems from land and place. Our languages, cultures, knowledge systems, and ultimately people. We all come from land and from specific places on the land. And so do our stories, so do the ways we communicate. And so wherever you are, there's going to be a specific way to tell stories and also specific stories that help us to understand what it means to be a being in that particular place. So stories, they don't just come out of thin air, but rather they have a setting and a context that's really important to how the story goes. And I've been told before that even telling a story outside of a place, the place that it, that it came about, of telling a story outside of its own place um, can lose a lot of the content of the story. And that's not words, but that's the energy and the wisdom of all that were there at the time of the story and the energy between them, whether they be human or non-human. So um, if we remember that the fabric of a story is the, those relationships, um, one of my elders, Larry McDermott, he says that each group that gets together has an energy that can only be replicated once in time and space. And that's true for any group of people, including us here on the call today. Um, but again, that's also true on the land and with our relations on the land. So words on a paper can tell that story or a human at any time or space can tell that story. Um, but if we can tell it in the space where that recounting is not only uh, not only human and body language, but there's also all of that memory uh, and language that's uh, coming together to tell that story, it can be really, really powerful. So um, that's not to say we shouldn't tell stories away from their places, because at the same time, when you tell a story out of its context, you can bring back a lot of memories and teachings that were there in that place on the land. Um, they, for, for, you know, for a long time, they've helped people to navigate on the land because we remember where we're going based on the stories that are told. And we remember, um, I guess, who the land is at, at particular places. So stories can tell us about where to find food, where it's safe, um, how, lo how long we should be in a place in a certain season, all kinds of information comes from these stories uh, that get passed on. So in that way, stories help us to build and maintain our relationships with land and all of the sentient beings on the land, no matter where we are, we take those little pieces um, from our journey with us, no matter where we go. I hope that makes sense. I think it's what you you said about it's both simple and not simple. It's like, yep, I think I I think that makes sense. And yet I'm sure that it's something like with many things actually that that you know you've shared with me over the years, Chloe. It's like something that kind of just keeps I keep coming back to it and being like, yeah, I, I mean, I thought I understood what story was about. And then, you know, again, I'll keep coming back and finding that there's more and more and more there. Um, I think uh, it's just kind of beautiful that you say that because it's really the beauty of story is as you hear it, you pick up more and you gain in terms of your own understanding and journey. So thanks for sharing that. Thanks, Chloe. Um, Okay, in the spirit of emergent process and decision making, <laughs> uh, Julie and I have been texting here behind the scenes uh, because we are um, exactly where we need to be, but we are off the plan, <laughs> which is usually a, a good a sign that we're into something good though, hey? 
Um, I, th I think I can assume Cesario and Sonia, you're okay to let Chloe kind of end this piece of the conversation. Um, and maybe we can move now into our breakout rooms. We had planned to do two separate breakout rooms, but I think we're gonna minimize transitions and we're gonna spend the next 20 minutes in one breakout room um, or like in separate breakout rooms, but in one kind of chunk of time. Um, and we will offer two questions that you can discuss or you can take it, you cannot answer those questions and you can use this time to process and digest what you've heard here today. Um, the facilitators of each breakout room will take notes um, so that we can go back through and kind of see what, what we make of this and, and how we can use this to inform the conversation around um, what does a high quality forest and nature school in Canada look like, sound like, feel like. Um, so I think I see uh, Stephanie putting the questions in the chat, but I'll, I'll say them now. Um, we're gonna, so actually, Julie, will you say that in French? What I, just a little, or did Stephanie do it? Is it? Maybe I'll just mention a few words so it's clear for everyone where okay. we're going since we're off the plan. Yeah. <laughs> Alors, um, ce que Petra mentionnait, c'est qu'on a pris un peu plus de temps que prévu. Alors, euh, dans un processus émergent, comme on les connaît si bien euh, à l'école de la nature, euh, ce qu'on va faire, c'est qu'au lieu d'avoir deux salles de discussion, on va en avoir une seule. Donc, euh, Par ça, je veux dire un moment de discussion au lieu d'avoir de deux moments de discussion. Et puis, euh, pendant ces moments, on aura deux questions à répondre au lieu d'une seule. Et puis, on prendra des notes pour partager un peu nos idées. Et puis, euh, c'est possible aussi de ne pas du tout répondre aux questions, puis tout simplement euh, discuter, puis un peu digérer ce qu'on a, euh, qu a entendu ce soir parce que c'était vraiment puissant. Donc, euh, c'est ce qu'on va faire euh, dans les prochains instants. Merci, Petra. Okay, merci, Julie. So our two questions to start off our discussions, um, if they serve, are how does a high quality forest and nature school support children in the processes of story making and storytelling? And how does a high quality forest and nature school use story to build engaged, healthy, vibrant, and diverse communities? So we, I think those are going up in the chat. We'll make an attempt to also put them in the announcements. So Rimsha, could you open up the breakout rooms for us and we'll come back at 5.30 to close and breakout room facilitators take good notes. Hi, I was put in the wrong room, I think. Okay.
Okay, I think we're all probably back. Um, yes, I think everything's closed. So normally we would have a share back period, but I think um, given the time that we have, we are instead going to just close our call today. Um, I don't know about you, but I was part of a really powerful breakout room. I'm feeling um, just so grateful and moved and like this was, I just have so much to think about. New connections are firing in my brain. Um, so if you, um, if you feel, oh, now I'm fully going off script as if I wasn't already off script. Sorry, Julie. But if you feel like you didn't have a chance to adequately kind of express yourself or new ideas come to you, um, please go ahead and fill out the survey that's always available on our website. I think there's probably space to free flow. You don't have to answer the specific questions. Um, and of course, you're always welcome to email us um, community at childnature.ca. Um, Rimsha, if you can put that in the chat or Stephanie, that would be great. Um, Okay, Julie, I did the forum stack. <laughs> Why don't you take the rest? <laughs> All good, Petra. Um, alors, pour la suite, euh, nous aurons d'autres causeries au coin du feu, probablement au cours de la nouvelle année, donc pas tout de suite. Puis on espère que vous allez vous joindre à nous. Um, C'est le fun d'avoir des participants qui parlent français aussi, qui se sont joints à nous. Um, quand on parle d'histoire, la langue est aussi importante, puis joue un rôle dans les histoires qu'on raconte. Donc, euh, c'est intéressant de pouvoir raconter nos histoires ici en français pour ceux qui sont francophones. Donc, merci, vous avez une place ici. Euh, aussi, euh, on va continuer à recueillir des indicateurs de qualité, puis euh, on continue de réfléchir à la manière dont on peut rendre tout ça opérationnel. Um, donc, uh, restez à l'affût pour uh, la suite. Um, I was just mentioning that uh, we'll have more fireside chats uh, probably in the new year. They might look differently, but uh, we will probably have some. I was also mentioning, um, I want to say thank you for your patience and having this in two languages. We're talking about story, but um, being able to tell our story in our language is also something. Um, that's important to lots of people. So being able to offer this in French, um, and I wish it could be offered in other languages too, um, is something that I hold dear to my heart. So thank you for your patience and uh, thanks for everyone who participated tonight. Yeah, thank you everybody so much. Um, my last reminder is just that the recording of this, as well as a summary of the conversations and the transcripts will be up on our website in the next few weeks. So thank you so much. Kahuna, um, merci. Thank you everybody for being part of this. And we'll see you again soon, I hope. <laughs>